Hi everyone, thanks for joining our talk today. Today we are going to share our thoughts on maintaining Kubernetes cluster reliability with an SLO driven approach. My name is Chen and I work at Ant Group as an infrastructure SRE. We have another SRE here on the cloud joining us today. Welcome, Tom. Hi, everyone. All right. So our primary interests include running large scale Kubernetes clusters while maintaining high reliability. So today's talk is going to divide it into three different parts. First, I will briefly talk about our motivations and the problems we encountered when we are doing reliability engineering on Kubernetes clusters. And then my colleague Tom will do a deep dive on SLO designs specifically for each Kubernetes component. And then I'll share some thoughts about doing SLO management. Specifically, I will introduce our SLO-based alerting mechanism to help us to monitor our system better. So, motivations. Um, today, cluster management becomes really increasingly challenging for us because our clusters really grow up really significantly. So for example, at end group, we have thousands of nodes in each clusters with millions of pods. And, you know, like as an SRE, our philosophy includes say, our headcount, say SRE headcount should only grow, say, stop linearly or even remain constant while our corresponding service grow up, right? So we have to deal with the exponential growth of Kubernetes part with only a small team. So fleet management is really challenging, especially when we are doing releases. As in SRE, we always do releases, right? Sometimes we have to roll out new components for master components in Kubernetes, say API server and schedulers. And somehow like when you are doing releases, you have to consider reliability, right? If you release too frequently, then in the early days, you may not know what happened in the cluster actually, right? Because all of the components interact with each other and it's really complicated. Another story is about doing node level component upgrade. Say you are going to release a new version of Kubelet. You know, when you are doing a release for 10,000 node cluster is a totally different story than doing a release for 10 node cluster, right? For example, let's say your Kubelet is trying to list all parts. And in a 10 node cluster, your API server may feel nothing because the load is really, really low, right? However, for 10,000 node cluster, if all the Kubelet are going to, like say, list all the parts for in the entire cluster and send a request to API server at the same time, trust me, your API server will shout out loudly and you may encounter situations like out of memory or even high CPU loads, which makes your cluster unusable. Well, you may argue that, well, the recommended way to do Kubelet update is to first reschedule all the pods from the, from the node and then do a code update, right? However, this is not possible in real world because you may not have enough capacity. Okay. So now let's talk about how we are going to do reliability engineering. So the general approach consists of three different stages. So the first stage is the production stage, which represents your service current status. And somehow if your production hit some issue or had some trouble, because maybe you triggered some alerts or some incident happened, then you are going to do going to the design and improvement stage where you sit down with your dev team and your customer to figure out what happened and maybe you have to do a postmodern review to figure out what to improve maybe it's some bug fix or maybe it's some alert management or some monitoring changes then you are going to the change management state in this state so you may follow your company's like change management policies. Maybe you can only do new releases during say business days on the business hours, right? Or maybe it's about to be Thanksgiving days and you have to do a production freeze. 
no commit or no release can be pushed except for like say emergency bug fixes. So a nestable based approach is just a specific implementation of the general reliability approach. So we, you just use the SLO as a lead to go through all the different stages. From the production stage to the improvement stage, you use the SLO based alerting to trigger your incident response. Your SREs will focus in more on SLO alerts and then use them to drive your dev team to do improvements and new designs. So in the design and change management stage transition, you may say, redefine your SLOs if after, let's say, a careful review, you believe your SLO doesn't represent or doesn't align with your user interest. Then you may go through, like say, the refinement stage to redesign your SLO. And then maybe some align with some code changes go into the change management stage. In this stage, you will use SLO documentations and agreements. So let's say you and your dev team agree on like say if the SLO is broken, I'm not going to push new releases until let's say the SLO is back to the normal level. So this is the general SLO based approach and the philosophy under it. And then I will hand over to my colleague to do a more deep dive on SLO designs for Kubernetes itself. Hi everyone, I'm Tom and I'm going to talk about SLO design for Kubernetes. First, let's do a quick recap on the definition of SLI, SLO and SLA. SLI is metrics that you use to measure your service health needs. For example, for HTTP server, it can be request error ratio or the average request latency. SLO is the quantitative target that you and your team try to achieve. For example, one can target the 99% success ratio for HTTP requests in your months. And finally, SLA is the promise you make to your user, like what the would the user expect to receive when you broke the SLO? For example, if somebody paid to use your HTTP service and you fail to deliver the 99% SLO target, you may compensate to your customer with cash. Sometimes internally, the word SLO and SLA are interchangeable. So back to our day-to-day -day job as an infra SRE, what do we care about the Kubernetes itself? As the chair mentioned before, at the Anti Group, we run dozens of clusters globally. And we have internal users to using Kubernetes for different purposes. For example, provision pavement and the transaction system database, as well as running batch jobs like machine learning. When we design our SEO, the first put is user first. That means SAO should represent the real user behavior and the experience. Each user may have different purposes when using Kubernetes. However, we can summarize them in four categories. The first and the most important SAO is about the resource delivery. Resource here often means code or computing resources in a, in a shape of deployment or step set. We care about delivery speed and success rate when using asking to create a deployment in our clusters. Related to this SAO, we believe we need to manage pod lifecycle precisely. This SAO targeted on a single pod, measuring it is creation, upgrade, deletion behavior. We use this SAO to figure out our system overall health status. And the third SAO we believe we should care is about whether all existing pods in the cluster are running as expected. If the cluster is having a network issue and the pod are disconnected with other clusters, we may say the pod entry or unhealthy state. Then we can sum up, sum, sum up all the health time of the all pods to calculate the cluster level pod uptime. Finally, we know user often interact with API server directly for query or other behavior. So we care about API server success ratio and latency. Let's take a close look in, into the 
one of the end-to-end -end SEO. We would like to come up with a metric to represent the end-to-end port creation behavior and the user are happy to see a promise like 99% port should create it successfully to reach a ready state within five minutes in a month. As you can see, the port creation workflow in Kubernetes is real conflicts. In real production Kubernetes cluster, you request the will pass wireless customized webhook, maybe a secondary scheduler to reach Kubernetes. Sometimes you may have multiple user defined controller to register your port to different external dependencies, just like CMDB network or metadata center. What a long journey for a port to create, create it. Our solution for measuring port creation SEO is to collect various port related audit log and event, put them into a centralized log analysis system with port name as the unicode index. Then the log analysis system can identify the latency during each port status transaction. For example, it spends three seconds during webhook admission, 10 seconds during the scheduling, and 13 seconds in imaging pooling. Also, the centralized log analysis system can identify if the port is in the desired state. Size user may have different requirements for creation latency. Some may tolerate 10 minutes, but some may only tolerate three minutes. Finally, we produce time series metrics to record the end-to-end -end SEO and let our monitor system to scrap the metrics and produce meaningful SEO-based alert. So we will talk about a lot later. After implementing several end-to-end -end SEO, we are facing new issues. Although we can leverage port event for log and size and the individual tracing, it is less obvious to identify root case for some component issue and the failures. When SRE receive alert about SEO failures, often we need to check different component dashboard to see if API server is returning better response or a customer or a customer controller is not working correctly to patch a required label for the port to run. The entire process is like top-down approach. You first know something bad happened and then you start to drill down on each individual component to find the platform. The good thing is about end-to-end -end SAO, it is less noise once your metrics is well designed. However, the root case search may take a longer time and may heavier rely on past experience. To take a step back, let's revisit the flow chart of the port creation. Although we have 10 components in this graph, we actually can model them in two types, namely synchronized components and asynchronized components. For synchronized components like API server, ETCD, mutating, and the validating webhook, their interaction model is more straightforward. Get a request in, process it internally, and send the response out. For asynchronized components, just like scheduler, controller, or customer operators. Their interaction models are more likely classical list and watch pattern and intent, intent driver. They need to watch resource status change and then into the reconcile queue and do the reconciliation repeatedly. So to design SAO for synchronous components, we believe we need to pay attention to request the error rate latency and also the component uptime. According to the Google SRE workbook, the other two, the other two golden signal are situation and the traffic. But we believe that these two signals are less important and we can have another way to include them in SAO design. For example, traffic actually can be measured from the client side. Almost every component talks to API server and each of them has metrics to indicating the success rate to talk to API server. A client-side monitoring aggregation on the request error ratio can somehow reflect the situation and the traffic condition. To design the asynchronous component SAO, similarly, we care about the reconcile error ratio and the latency. Of course, component uptime. Since most of the component runs as 
a leader follower pattern. So we can define SAO for leader selection time and no leader time. The reconcile query system is another interesting accept, accepted of asynchronous component. So we can design SAO for the queue depths and the oldest unacknowledged item to help us mature component healthiness. Okay, finally, to summarize our overall SAO design is a combination to top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. We first separate the SAOs into two layers. The upper layer is about end-to-end -end SAO, which we believe both user and the SRE care, including the resource deliver, port lifecycle, API server interaction, existing port healthiness. The bottom layer focuses more on individual component, and we believe SRE and the devs cares more on this layer. Each individual component SAO helps us identify bottlenecks and the limit in our Kubernetes cluster. And, the, and then we can take concrete action to improve each of them. Okay, next, I will hand back to Chen to talk about SAO management. Thank you. All right, thanks Tom for sharing. Now I'll talk about how we do SLO management. Specifically, I'll use an example of doing SLO-based alerting. Suppose we have an SLO, say 99.9% .9 of the requests to API server are successful every month. So this means a successful request will like say return HTTP status code less than 500. This is kind of simple and straightforward, right? So as an SRE, you can actually set up a very simple alert based on the ratio rate. As I listed here in this following Prometheus code snippet, you first define two recording rules, one to sum up all the SLI error count in a minute, and the other recording rules to sum up all the total count in a minute, right? So now we have the per minute like error count and total count, we simply do a division and compare it with 0.1%. Uh, and if the error ratio is greater than 0.1%, we alert. And if you have set up this type of alert in the past, you may already find out that this is very problematic because you will receive a lot of noise. As I demonstrate here in this hypothetical error ratio graph, so if you use the ratio rate alert setup, then every spike here, which above this horizontal line, will trigger the alert. And it will cost you and the SRE team a bunch of operational hours to deal with the noise and maybe to deal with the real outage. And then you may think about, say, how can we reduce the noise, right? A very straightforward thinking is to add a holding period. Let's say if this error ratio continues for five minutes, then we trigger the alert. However, this is also problematic because I can easily bypass this type of alert, but still broke my SLO. Because you can think about this situation. Let's say in the first three minutes, your API server receives like 100% error rate. And then in the next two minutes, because there is no traffic, let's say there is no traffic. And so the error rate is like say 0%. And then the traffic comes in again and it becomes 100% error. And then two minutes, there's no traffic. This repeated pattern will cost you 60% error rate or let's say 100%. So again, this type of alert failed to capture this type of like, outage. So what can we do? So let's reconsider our alerting philosophy. We know that our SLO target should never be 100%, otherwise it's meaningless. That means like, so for the total requesting amounts, we can divide them into two parts. We have an expected portion that we want to serve reliably, right? It can be 99.9% .9 of the total requests. And we always have like say 0.1% error portions that we think we can manage the risk of it. 
right? So these risks can sometimes come from your dependency failures or you can encounter uh, unexpected network hiccups, right? So this red portion, we call it the error budget that we can tolerate. Then we can come up with our learning strategy. So first we set up our slow target, say 99.9% the request to API server are successful every month. And then we implement our SLI metrics to monitor our SLO, right? So typically we have two metrics, the error metric and the total metric. And then we can figure out our maximum tolerable failed requesting amounts. That is our error budget. And then we only alert if a predefined portion of the error budget are consumed in a short time window. So to demonstrate this philosophy, I set up two levels of our alerts. Say the first level is the page level. That means SREs needs to come up with the solution really quickly because it's really an emergency issue. So the page alert says number of SLI failures in an hour, if it's greater than 3% of the entire error budget of the month. The error budget calculation is a very straightforward, simple math. One minus 0 0.999 times the number of total requests in a month, right? If that happened, then we alert so that we need to react on these failures. And we have another level, say the ticket level. This is to deal with those somehow mild situation. Say the SLOs, SRI failures in a day, say it's greater than 5% of the entire error budget. So why we choose 3% and 5% here? So 3% in an hour, it means like say in 34 hours, we will burn up all of our error budget. So we will miss our SLO target for the month. And for 5% portion in a day, it means in 20 days, if we do nothing, that means the SLO will be broken. So to implement these alerts in practice, let's say we use Prometheus as an example in this code snippet. Let's say I want to implement the page level alert. So other than the per minute SLI error count and the SLI total count, which we used in the ratio rate based alert, we need to come up with two more recording rules. One to sum up all the error counts in the past hour. So we sum up the time for the per minute error count. This is also very straightforward, right? And we can come up with another recording rules to get the monthly total count. This can help us calculate the error budget very straightforward. Um, so then we can come up with the final alert. The left hand side is apparently the hourly SLI error count and the right hand side is the 3% of the error budget. Anyway, due to the time limit, I can only share this much about SLO alerting. So to do a quick recap on today's session, we basically talk about three different things. First, how we define our fine-grained SLOs for Kubernetes clusters, right? We do component level and we do like the user level. So users may care more about end-to-end -end SLOs and we care more about on component level. And we know how to use SLO-based metrics to do our monitoring and alerting because they are less noisy and can be very effective. I don't have enough time to go through um, how we do SLO documentations and how we do discussions with our partners and dev team to reach agreements, but we can discuss them later. Well, in the future, since our Kubernetes clusters continue to grow, and we need to continuously review our SLOs to align with our user interests. And maybe we will do like say monthly or quarterly SLO reports for like the entire fleet. Anyway, we already started another like, say, interesting project on automation. We want to automate the recording process based on our SLO based alerts and other SLO based metrics. Anyway, Thanks for listening and now we can take some questions.